everybody, it's Baby Bailey. Bailey, say hello to the live studio audience. Oh no, you're the live studio audience. If you can see Bailey and hear me, let me know. So Bailey's got a haircut since you guys saw her last. This is episode 38. You know, one of the questions today is, can you convince me to go to the conference in Vegas? I'm gonna try, but the main reason to go is to meet Bailey because we're gonna be passing her around like a joint at a rock concert. And everybody's <laughs> gonna get a chance with her. So I'm gonna put you down, okay, Bailey? And I wanna show you the new addition to my family. The three quart baby iPod. This is adorable. And I'm sorry that it's not in the store yet. They sent it to me so I could test it and do some videos, which I'm gonna be doing. But I gotta tell you, I love it. You can go to YouTube and see my other demonstrations. I always said that the eight quart was my favorite and it still is, but this is gonna be my second favorite because it's gonna be great for travel. It does everything that the big Instant Pots do, but it's so cute. It takes up a lot less space on your counter, but it's enough to cook my rice and cook my greens and I love it. The baby three quart iPod get yours today and when it's in the store at instantpot.com you can use my name AJ for ten dollars off okay so it's all girls today because Kenny's taking the week off because it's his birthday his party's actually tonight so what have you got for me evening hey everybody oh why don't I welcome the people welcome to episode 38 of weight loss Wednesday I'm chef AJ the creator of the ultimate weight loss program and this is where I answer your questions about healthy permanent and sustainable weight loss. So Angela had a question about UWL Live in Las Vegas. Uh -huh. For example, how is the day slash agenda structured? What type of clothes should a person wear? Is there free time during the day or is it a full non-stop day? Is it interactive or all lectures or both? Is JP giving exercise yes, classes? Yes, yes. And what could you tell someone who's on the fence to help them to decide? Okay, so I'll answer the first part of that question first. The Live Ultimate Weight Loss Conference takes place in the Tuscany Hotel and Suites in Las Vegas, Nevada, right off the strip, September 1st, 2nd, 3rd, Labor Day weekend. We have a few spots left and I can get you a $100 discount if you want, even if you're not UWL, but the rooms may be sold out now because it is a holiday weekend. The conference features myself and John Pierre. It also features Dr. Doug Lyle, Dr. Alan Goldhammer, Dr. Carrie Saunders. And of course, Bailey and my husband Charles will be there. And many, many people from the Ultimate Weight Loss Program will be there as well as other people as well. The conference is Saturday and Sunday from 9 a.m. to about 5.30 or 6 p.m. There is an optional boot camp that JP, the other half of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, will be running on both Saturday and Sunday from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m., which gives you an hour before the conference starts if you want to eat breakfast, if you want to take a shower. There also is an optional meet and greet on Friday if you wanna be with a smaller group and meet the tribe and spend some time talking to the doctors, that's from four to six, that's on Friday. Some people are coming to that, some people aren't. It is structured like a conference, so there is no free time scheduled in. There's a few breaks between speakers, maybe 15 minutes, and there is an hour scheduled for lunch both days, which in, is included in your ticket price and it is going to be a compliant lunch probably like a potato bar salad bar we did a tasting they did a good job without SOS these rooms are sweet so you're going to have a refrigerator or microwave and a coffee pot but remember you still always got to make sure you have enough food with you because you want to be able to eat when hungry but we should be giving you enough food I would hope now Saturday night there's an optional dinner at Panvino SOS free gourmet that is sold out I'm sorry there is a Whole Foods nearby that you can get great things at the salad bar. There is a Trader Joe's nearby. There's a Sweet Tomatoes, which is like Sioux Plantation. And uh, the Wynn has vegan options, but not SOS free. So you'll be fine. And so why to come? You know, before I became a chef in the year 2000, most of my life, my job was being an activity director at nursing homes and retirement homes and hospitals. And I probably gave more eulogies than anybody that's a non-clergy person in my life. And you get to know people as they're dying and on hospice, and nobody on their deathbed ever said, you know, I wish I hadn't have done something. Even when something was a mistake, it's always, I wish I had. And if you don't go, and then you see the buzz on the boards, and you see the way we're talking, you're gonna kick yourself, because this is not an annual conference. This is my 20th conference. I do not wanna produce conferences anymore. They're too stressful, they're too expensive, and I don't enjoy it, but I felt like we really needed to do one for the masses. We've been doing this in LA every year, and it's been phenomenal. 
but not everybody can come to LA as easily. Vegas is the cheapest, funnest, most affordable place to come. When I said we offer discounts for your kids, I didn't mean at the conference. I meant a lot of people are bringing their families because there's so much to do in Vegas, and we will offer your family meals at our cost so that you can dine with them at both days, but not to come to the conference cheaper. So what will you get? You're gonna get some special material that you won't hear anybody else I, anywhere else. I just interviewed Dr. Lyle today for 90 minutes for my YouTube show, and he said, should I talk about blank? And I don't wanna say what blank is, but he has some new research with food addiction. And I said, don't you dare talk about that. Don't you tell anybody about it. I wanna be like the one to get the scoop. He's gonna talk about something that he explained to me that's absolutely gonna blow your mind. And you know, people say, well, can you live stream it? Well, it's very expensive to live stream from a hotel. You have to buy cable, so probably not. So, you know, if you really wanna be there, you'll find a way to be there, you know? What do they say? When people wanna do something, they find a way. When they don't, they find an excuse. It's gonna be mind-blowing, and my husband Charles is gonna give a talk. And you get to meet the tribe, you know. Now these people that you've been communing with every day for days, weeks, months, or years, you get to see them in person, and there's nothing more valuable than that. That's really the main pe reason people go to church. I mean, you know, almost all churches now, at least big ones, do their services online. You know, for shut-ins, people can go to the church by turning on the computer, but most people still prefer to go because that's where you get the oxytocin and all those feel-good hormones from connecting in person with people that get you. So. You know, it, 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 it's not that expensive compared to most conferences. We're basically breaking even, and you can buy it on PayPal, and then six months you have to pay it off interest-free, making six payments. So, you know, and again, meeting Bailey, I mean, <laughs> that's got to be the biggest draw of all. So I hope you'll come. But make up your mind soon because the hotel is either sold out or close to being sold out. And we're hoping to get Eden to come. But <laughs> Eden needs a place to stay. So anybody out there live in Vegas that will put Eden up, and there's another girl from the tribe that can't afford a hotel. If anybody will house a couple of UWLers, let me know. As long as you're not freaks and murderers <laughs> and things like that. So Stephanie wanted to know if you can send her Ann Esselstyn's potato yeah. salad recipe. Okay, so um, this is from the potato salad recipe that I showed a couple weeks ago. Is from the Prevent Reverse Heart Disease Cookbook. It is on page, I know it's here because I put it post it. It's on page 139, it's called Jen's Potato Salad. So I don't feel comfortable sending copyrighted material of somebody else's, especially somebody that is a friend like Ann Nesselson. You know, when my book on process came out seven years ago, people were posting my recipes everywhere and not even giving me credit. It's just, it's especially as an author, it's just not cool, it's not what we do. That's how she makes her living, writing recipes, and it would be very disrespectful. So, you know, if you can't afford the book, you could check it out at your library, you could get the Kindle version. So I'm really sorry, I'm not comfortable doing that. So, but it's a great recipe, and it's all compliant and very easy to make, and brought it to a lot of potlucks. Daphne wanted, said that she just joined yesterday okay. after watching your videos for about a year now. She what finally, took you so long? <laughs> she finally decided it's time because she was diagnosed with fibroids and she knows her weight is a factor in developing them. She knows you're not a doctor, but is wondering if you have any advice regarding fibroids and diet. Mm -hmm. Hey, and if you like what you're seeing, please share because that really helps me out. So Daphne is one of four of the gang in Scooby-Doo. She's the hot redhead, love the name. So yeah, I'm not a doctor, but I've read stories like on the Dr. Furman website of people that have healed from fibroids from eating a health promoting diet. What I would suggest is that you contact Dr. Ellen Goldhammer by going to the True North website, healthpromoting.com, get your free consult, because I know for sure, and I believe it's even on the website, people whose fibroids have completely disappeared through therapeutic water only fasting. All I can say is this way of eating that I promote in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. You know, I, you notice I don't say the Ultimate Weight Loss Diet because it's not my diet, it's Daniel's diet, it's God's diet, it's Dr. Esselstyn's diet, Dr. Dr. Goldhammer's diet. It's, it's the same, it's, it, I didn't make up the diet, I created a program to give people support. There is nothing that it doesn't improve. I mean, you know, if somebody's schizophrenic, you know, will they become non-schizophrenic? Probably not, but I've heard even things like severe mental illness has gotten somewhat better. So the thing is, is don't try it, try it for a long time, see if it improves, but if it doesn't on its own, that's where therapeutic water-only fasting can come in because you know, people that are doing a pretty good job on the diet sometimes still have unretractable high blood pressure, even if they go salt-free. But then doing that water fast at True North just kicks it up 
a notch. There was a lady, and I believe she's on the website, Christina, a dentist who was in a car accident and had a concussion and had a headache for like seven years and it took two 40 day water fasts and she's fine now. So again, give it a try. The diet will improve it. Will they get rid of your fibroids? I don't know, but I've heard that fasting can. So I definitely fill out the intake form on the health promoting.com website and see what success Dr. Goldhammer has. He's been in business for 32 years. I believe he's seen over 30,000 patients. So good luck and good for you for wanting to change your diet, but don't wait a year to join. Doris asked, how would you handle being in a situation of two different families using one kitchen when they eat differently? Okay, so I would refer Doris to YouTube please feel free to subscribe to my channel, Chef AJ. And there's two videos we recently did called Mastering the Environment Part 1 with Dr. Doug Lyle and Mastering the Environment Part 2 with PCRM cooking instructor Sharon McRae. So the way I would handle it might be different than the way other people would handle it, but you know, my kitchen, my rules, take it or leave it. I always believe you defer to the one with the problem, not that, not that uh, eating healthily should be considered a problem, but if somebody's a food addict and can't have certain foods, you defer to them, you eat the crap outside the house. And so you defer to the healthiest person in the equation. And if somebody has a different eating style, you make one meal that's compliant. And if they wanna add something non-compliant, then they have to go out, procure it themselves, buy it themselves, pay for it themselves, and cook it themselves. That's how I respond. Because I'm gonna tell you, I have never seen anybody and again, I've only worked with a couple thousand people, pales in comparison to how many McDougal, Goldhammer, and Lyle have worked with, but I have never seen one person that had a clean environment, and I mean really clean, that wasn't successful. On the other hand, when the environment isn't clean, it's very, very hard to be successful. Impossible? Maybe not, but extremely difficult. So that's how I would do. You defer to the healthy person and the unhealthy person they have to go out and get it. That's I, And my answer is never gonna change, especially because I interviewed Dr. Lyle for 90 minutes today and I think he concurred once again, environment's the number one predictor of your success, so how bad do you wanna be successful? You gotta clean up the environment if you do, because you can't change your behavior until you change your environment. And I won't even work with somebody locally unless I can throw away what I want in their house and do spot checks because they're not gonna succeed, or at least not to the degree that the Shadas and the Heathers and the Tammies and the Kristens and the BJs have succeeded to, so. Letha said, I know the general advice is to eat your food whole mm -hmm. with the water and fiber intact mm -hmm. and the sweet smoothies are generally not considered helpful for weight loss, but I can't recall you saying anything about blended soups. I've been eating blended soups as my vegetables for breakfast for the past few days, so I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. I'm taking tomatoes, carrots, collard greens, garlic, and ginger, and then blending it in the blend tech. Then simmering it, simmering it on the stove a bit with some onion flakes and Italian seasoning. Yum. I have IBS and find I do better with veggies in general if they are cooked, peeled, and chopped small. The soup seems to agree with me. Great. I have IBS too. And if you have a blend tech, Letha, why are you simmering it on the stove? Because a blend tech's a high powered blender like a Vitamix. You could run it for like three minutes and then you'll have hot soup. I'm just trying to save you dirtying another pan for cooking. So there's a big difference between blending vegetables in a savory way for a soup that's eaten hot and for a smoothie that's generally sweet and drunk cold, drink and cold, whatever the past tense of drink is. And I believe Dr. Esselstyn talks about this too because he's not a fan of smoothies. And smoothies aren't the end of the world. I, it's just that when you eat your food whole as opposed to processed and, and should, blenders are not processing the food in the same way that refining foods are like sugar and flour where you're stripping things and and removing fiber and the way we know this and you can do this maybe you can't do this experiment Letha, because you you're having a hard time with with raw produce but the way I learned this was from Dr. Lyle when I was at True North Health in 2011 50 pounds heavier and I was drinking a healthy green smoothie every single day, which was much better than my previous breakfast, which was a Coke Slurpee with eight pumps of vanilla syrup, but I wasn't losing any weight. And so what he told me to do is when I got home from True North to put everything in the blender, which at that time was two cups of frozen blueberries, a frozen banana, two tablespoons of flaxseed, eight ounces of almond milk, eight ounces of spinach or kale or a combination, and to put it all in the blender, but instead of pushing blend, to pour it out in a bowl and eat it. And when I tried to eat the contents of the blender, I got full at about the halfway mark. The blender of sharp blades of the Vitamix artificially reduces the volume. And what one of the things that contributes to satiety is not just the water and the fiber, 
together, which creates the bulk, but the bulk itself. And what happens is you're reducing the bulk when you blend it. So, and also when a smoothie, it's cold, it's sweet, it's delicious. You, it, you know, it's like a, it's like a treat. It's very easy to slug it down. And those 400 calories in that smoothie, when I drank it as a smoothie, I was absorbing every calorie. But when I was chewing the food whole, I was not absorbing every calorie because in the chewing of the food, because digestion starts in the mouth with a digestive enzyme called amylase, you're actually burning calories chewing and you're actually burning calories digesting it whole. So maybe I was absorbing 25% less of the calories eating in its whole food form. That said, soups are a little bit different because they're, they're eaten hot, so you're not just slurping it down, but also there's no sweet involved. I mean, there's some sweetness, of course, to tomatoes and other vegetables, but it's not like a sweet beverage. That So it's not the same. You're generally eating it with a spoon. You're not drinking it with a straw. So it's perfectly fine. And again, if anybody has digestive issues, whether it's IBS or Crohn's or, or you know, um, diverticulitis and stuff, you're going to have a hard time eating large volumes of vegetables, especially at first, especially if they're raw. So cooked is a great way to do it, and soups are a great way to do it. Even people that aren't on this program, they've proven that soup is one of the ways to lower the overall caloric density of your meal. And Dr. Rolls in her book Volumetric talks about experiments that just starting every meal with, with a soup, like a broth-based or a vegetable soup, not like a cream soup, like a clam chowder, that you that people eat less at the meal. So starting every meal with a soup is great. You know, We talk about sequencing the meals because we have a question later on about plateaus. And one of the first things I ask people when they say they're experiencing a plateau is, are you sequencing your meals? If you saw episode 36 where I showed that I eat 10 pounds of food a day, one of the things that's significant is that I eat it in order of increasing caloric density. There's many reasons for that. Is one, because when you eat a food of higher caloric density, you're producing more of those pleasure chemicals like dopamine in the brain. And there's no way you're gonna go from eating a hot fudge sundae to eating steamed kale. You might go from eating steamed kale to a hot fudge sundae. So the thing is, is when you eat foods of a higher caloric density first, it's pretty much impossible to go back. So if you've eaten this delicious meal of air french fries or roasted sweet potatoes, it's pretty hard then to go back and eat your steamed greens or go back and eat your salad. So this is important, especially where weight loss is concerned because by filling up on the most calorically dilute foods first, and we like to say in caloric density that dilution is the solution, you start to feel full and activate those stretch and nutrient receptors so that you are satisfied with less of the good stuff, meaning the starch, the potatoes, rice, and beans. And so soup is a great way to do it. What they recommend at True North and what they recommend in general for sequencing is you start with a salad because raw vegetables are the lowest in caloric density. They're 100 calories per pound on average. Some vegetables are as low as 67 calories per pound. So you start with a raw salad. If you watch Shada on the, well, she didn't do this to everyone. It was just on, in the Ultimate Weight Loss group. She did a live feed the other day. She always starts with a large raw salad. I mean, a whole pound of salad, guys, is 100 calories. A whole pound of salad is less calories than a tablespoon of olive oil, which if you're eating in a restaurant, you're getting many more tablespoons than that, whether you want it or not. After you eat the salad, and this is how we eat at True North, then you eat a large serving of steamed vegetables, maybe greens. It doesn't necessarily have to be a whole pound, especially if you just ate a pound of salad, but cooked vegetables are 125, 150, 200 calories a pound. And then you go on to the more concentrated starches. But having a soup in place of the cooked vegetables, to me, it's the same thing. You know, water has weight and it adds volume, but by itself, it exits the digestive tract too quickly. But when it's blended or bound into food, then you feel full. So soup is a terrific thing to do. I recommend it. It's not the same as drinking a smoothie and you're gonna eat it slower because it's hot. You're probably gonna eat it with a spoon. And, and this is a great thing to do for people that are on the go. People that say, well, I, I don't have time to sit there and eat a pound of vegetables in the morning. Get a thermos. They have thermoses now that are so good they keep your food hot or cold for 24 hours and make a blended soup like you're talking about. Put it in there and then uh, we had a question from a teacher last week. I said, then drink your soup. And if, 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 if you need starch, then you put starch in with the soup. But great, great thing and, it's, it, and especially because you enjoy it and especially because it's not upsetting your IBS, people definitely do better on vegetables that are cooked when they have digestive issues and of, of course cutting it small helps because one of the biggest things with digestive problems is you guys aren't chewing your food. You know, we got so used to eating processed food 
food like chicken McNuggets and donuts and Cinnabon that we've practically lost our ability to chew. And so when you're asked to eat whole natural food with fiber, you actually have to chew it. You have to chew it well, or as Dr. Clapper says, to a cream. And a lot of your digestive upsets, not all of them, but a lot of them will go away if you really chew your food and are eating, not when you're driving or stressed or watching TV or doing your computer, but when you actually take the time to eat a meal a little bit more mindfully. Of course, but even mindful eating, if you're eating crap, is not gonna be helpful. Are people watching? I'm not hearing anything. Yes, Hello, yes. Hello, everyone. There's over 180 right now. Share it so we can get 400. And if I can get over 400, Facebook will uh, do something nice for me. I'm not sure what, but we did that one week, the week that I showed the 10 pounds of food. Is that why we had 400? Because I'll show 10 pounds of food every week if we get 400 <laughs> people watching. So Valerie is a nutrition educator for PCRM Food for Life. Good and she often has to make recipes for her classes that are not 100% UWL compliant. They're still very healthy though. She has classes starting in the fall and needs to practice making the curriculum recipes and taste them to know what she's feeding her students. But that will mess with her compliance goals. Sure. Of course, tasting the meal to check it doesn't mean she'll have to eat the whole batch. Um, she Good doesn't luck with that. <laughs> she doesn't <laughs> think she's a refined food quote-unquote addict but she tries to live as though she is she doesn't want to fall into the pleasure trap again she just wonders how you can handle this how she can handle this aj because she says um she notices that you still cook rich yummies and some non-compliant with mm -hmm. uwl meals sure. for others yeah um so i don't cook non non-compliant meals for others occasionally i will make a rich dessert for a celebrity that's paying me a lot of money and it's getting rarer and rarer and I say no to almost everyone. There's only two people that I actually say yes to and I'm not gonna say their names because I'm not allowed to. But I don't cook anything that's triggered for me. So in other words, I'm allergic to soy, like really badly. And so I'm not gonna eat soy no matter what. So all these rich desserts I'm making are soy based so there's not a chance in hell that I'm gonna taste them. So that's number one. Uh, uh, number two, I would encourage you to talk to Sharon McRae. She is in Ultimate Weight Loss, so you can tag her there or go to her website, Eat Well, Stay Well, or I can give you her email. It's, just, it's Sharon at Eat Well, Stay Well. There's a dash between Eat Well and Stay Well because she is a PCRM cooking instructor and she does not make anything non-compliant. You know, if they fire you because you don't want to eat something unhealthy, then is that the right job for you? I don't think they will. You could talk to Dr. Barnard and explain the situation. I don't see why they would make a big deal. I mean, you could, you could still give the recipe out the way it is, and you could say, look, I'm sorry, I can't use this ingredient for such and such a reason. And I mean, that's what Sharon does. She has never compromised her uh, ethics or her values or her eating for this job. And I think if it came to it, she would just not take the job. She would choose her own. I mean, if the, the thing is they care about that the food is delicious. And so from what I understand, some of the recipes maybe have some agave or, or salt. You know, I mean, maybe you don't know. It depends how long you've been doing UWO. We can make everything taste delicious without it. So if you, sh if you have trouble tweaking a recipe for your class, I'm pretty much sure I can help you. And I think that uh, that's one solution. The other solution is, is you don't have to taste it. You can get somebody else to taste it, somebody you trust. And, and ask them if it's good, you know. So I don't, you know, um, one of the reasons I quit my job as a pastry chef is when I found out that food addiction was real, I had a consultation with one of the world's leading experts and they said, you better quit your job if you want to recover. And it, as luck would have it, the universe decided for me because the restaurant was sold. So there's your options, don't do it, ask for permission to do it, or get somebody else to taste the recipes. But I don't think you should ever have to compromise your eating for any job ever ever and that's why so many people struggle in uwl because they own bakeries that aren't even vegan bakeries or they're working in restaurants it's that's your environment for eight hours a day it's really going to be hard so you know you don't want to have those ingredients around even for the class so don't do it that's my advice don't do it no job is worth compromising any of your goals for and you know how hard it is to crawl out of the pleasure trap once you fall in that's a big sinkhole so be careful <laughs> Teresa wants to know if it's possible for a person's weight to stall at a high weight, and VG wants to know if you can talk about plateaus. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, anything's possible. But if you were able to lose weight in the vortex, and I call that that because that's what Dr. Lyle and I are calling Santa Rosa, because I get so many clients that's, that have actually said to Dr. Lyle or Dr. Goldhammer in front of me, I do everything AJ says and I can't lose weight. And then they go to the Vortex, which is Santa Rosa, California. And they attend either the McDougal 10-day program or they go to True North, and all of a sudden they can lose weight. 
my program, or at least the diet on my program, is the same diet that they have served and taught at True North for 32 years. Dr. Lyle always says, and you, again, you can watch this one video that I recommend, and really watch it, and watch it over and over, called Losing Weight Without Losing Your Mind. It's on YouTube, and it's also on his website, Esteem Dynamics. The versions are slightly different. There's a little bit of information to gain by watching both of them. He says, anytime somebody's overweight, that means there's always a little bit too much rich food in, in the diet for that person. We're genetically different. If you have curvy genes, if you're from a large family, it's unfortunate that you're not gonna necessarily lose weight as quickly as other people. And so that's why you have to tighten the screws and be even more diligent. Now, if you had told me that when you were at True North fasting or eating, you lost no weight, I would say, hey, we got a real problem here. You need to see an endocrinologist, talk to one of the True North doctors. But if your weight is stalled at a weight that's too high, which I think you're still 50 pounds, I mean, I don't know, you're still overweight by your own admission and by the number you told me, is you are eating too much to, to lose weight. You know, it's still a matter of calories. You have, if you eat more calories than you need, you'll either maintain, well, you'll gain weight. And if you eat the same amount of what you need, you'll maintain your weight. And if you eat less, you'll lose weight. And so if it's not working what you're eating, you need to change it up. You might need to do some intermittent fasting. We have a question about that coming up. Narrowing the feeding window. It's actually intermittent feeding, Dr. Goldhammer says, not intermittent fasting. Are you sequencing your meals? And you know, well, it's too hard to eat steamed vegetables. Well, too bad, you know. Uh, <laughs> if you eat in order of increasing calorie density, if you really eat your big salad first, and don't include the legumes like you're doing in it because that's your starch, if you really eat your big salad first, if you then eat your steamed vegetables or your hot soup and then eat your starch, you'll be so full you're gonna to have to lower the caloric density of your meal. You know, people say, I can't lose weight. Well, here's the thing. Salad is 100 calories a pound. It's really hard to eat a pound of salad. So if you weigh 150 pounds, are you really telling me you can eat 15 pounds of raw vegetables a day? Probably not. Try eating just vegetables for a day and see how many pounds you can eat. I mean, I eat four pounds a day and it's, it's a lot. It, so you are not eating enough calorically dilute food in relation to the calorically dense food that you're eating. So that's what I say is happening. And how much movement are you getting? You know, the only safe way to raise your metabolism without drugs is to exercise. Are you starting every day with some vigorous exercise? You need to. That's, I mean, if you want to jumpstart your metabolism. So yeah, plat I mean, there's, in which video does Dr. Lyle talk about plateaus? I, I can't remember which one. Maybe it was um, a, I think it was during interviews I've seen him talk about that. It, he talks about them and they absolutely can be broken. You know, Shada had one for seven months. And, and the reason I know that anyone can lose weight is because Shada, what she talked about in her live feed, Shada was already at a great goal weight for her height and she has lost over 100 pounds now in the last five years, kept it off on the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. She has she having a kitchen remodel. She'd have lost eight pounds just because she doesn't have a kitchen. I mean, she didn't need to lose weight. She wasn't trying to lose weight, but because she can't cook anything, she's eating just basically raw salads and things that she can make in her Instant Pot, she lost eight pounds. So again, you know, I've done experiments on Charles without his knowledge where I've changed the caloric density of his food and he didn't know and he lost more weight. So if you are finding yourself at a weight that is too high for where you wanna be, you've gotta look at the caloric density. Are you eating at restaurants? Because you know oil is sneaking in. Are you adding salt, which is making you eat more food or sugar or flour? There's, if you really keep an honest food journal, I mean a really, really honest one, because Dr. McDougal says that all dieters are liars. I'm not saying you're lying. If you're really honest about it, the clues are in there as to why your weight's not budging. Because if you have more weight on your body than you want and you're not losing any weight, either the, the percentage of fat in the diet is too high or the, you're just, you're not eating in caloric density. You have to do that. You know, try eating just fruits and vegetables for a day like we recommend in Mastery. I don't recommend that for people with a history of anorexia or bulimia or restricting, and you'll see your, your weight will move. And even we didn't write this on the list, but I forgot because when I talked about high fat, you know, Marley had a question about success that people were having on ketogenic diets or vegan ketogenic diets, and they were losing weight fast. You know, I'm gonna be interviewing dietitian Brenda Davis soon and we're gonna talk about this because the truth is is you can lose weight on any dietary style. You can lose weight on a high fat diet, on a low carb diet, on any kind of diet you can, on a weighing and measuring program. All diets work, that is not the problem. The problem is the sustainability. 
And if you look at the medical research, which I encourage you to do, sometimes you have to pay to look at these articles. And when I post them, some you guys say, well, they want $35. Well, you can't get in if you haven't subscribed. But what the research is showing is that while you can lose weight on any dietary style, the low fat diet is the most sustainable for weight management. And this is from James Hill, who runs the National Weight Control Registry. And the reason is, is because having a low fat diet means you can have a, a diet of a greater volume of food because fat is so calorically dense that you can't eat as much of it. And so when you're on a low fat diet, you get to eat more food and therefore it's gonna be more sustainable. So these people that are on these ketogenic diets, these low carb diets, they always have to have cheat days because they're really still hungry and they're not satisfied with their food. So keep in mind that whatever diet style you choose to lose weight, better be one that you like because that's exactly what you need to do once weight loss is achieved. And that's really one of the biggest mistakes people make. They think that this is a diet and that they can go on and off it. No, this is a lifestyle. And this is the same way we recommend people eat even when they're not overweight to prevent and reverse diseases. And it's important to mention that people don't know what kind of weight they're losing. On ketogenic low carb diets, yeah. oftentimes it's your body literally eating your muscles away right, exactly. to give your body fuel and turn it into glucose. Which is another reason to come to the Live Ultimate Weight Loss Conference because Dr. Carrie Saunders will be talking specifically about weight loss and what, what weight compromises com comprises what your weight is, your bone, your stool, your muscle, and she'll be doing BIA, bioimpedance analysis, which is really the only way to accurately weigh yourself. So yes, another reason, thank you. Um, <laughs> anybody, Diane? anybody asking anything there? I can't see, so to me it looks like I'm just talking to the back of my iPhone. <laughs> you know? um, nobody's really asking right, any yeah, questions right. right now. All right, share guys, just sharing commenting. is caring. I like the shares more than I like the hearts. So Diane said she's having trouble figuring out what to eat for her first meal of the day. Mm -hmm. The thought of eating greens makes her gag. Well, then eat something that the thought of doesn't make you gag that's a non-starchy vegetable. The more resistant a person is to eating savory breakfasts in general and vegetables in particular, usually the more they are addicted to the sugar, the fat, the salt, and the flour. Because vegetables in general, greens in particular, they alkalize you. And when this nauseates you, it's usually because you're eating out or have been eating too much of the other stuff. If you stop eating it, eventually, meaning the other stuff, this stuff will taste good. And the thing is you need to wait, you know, nobody's gonna eat vegetables unless they're hungry. Nobody, no animal on the earth. You, you don't eat these calorically dilute foods unless that's all that's available. And so anybody will eat oatmeal and fruit for breakfast. It's delicious or toast or things like that. But that's how you know you're really hungry. And if the thought of eating greens makes you gag, what about another non-starchy vegetables? Does do cherry tomatoes make you gag? Does jicama make you gag? I mean, greens are the best for turning off the hunger switch and fighting those cravings for sugar, but any savory breakfast will do and any vegetable will do to start out. And you don't have to start out with a whole pound if it's too much. You can start out with a half a pound, a quarter of a pound, an eighth of a pound. And then when you're hungry again, eat a little bit more. But the truth is, is if you are not hungry enough to eat vegetables, you are not hungry. Because when you are hungry, any food will satisfy your hunger, even lowly vegetables at 100 calories a pound. When you require particular foods to satisfy your hunger, that's not hunger, that's cravings, addiction, and appetite. So uh, the more you do it, the more you will like it. And with people who once said this, the thought of it made them gag, it's now they're addicted to this. It's the favorite part of their day and they can't imagine not starting the day with it. And one of the things I discussed in the interview with Dr. Lancaster today is that um, it, it, when you have a habit like that, you feel proud. And when you feel pride, you end up doing more things that increase your self-esteem. And so really what it is, is it's, it's kind of a self-esteem tool, eating, eating the most healthful breakfast that you can imagine, which is vegetables. So start your day in a savory and nutrient-dense way. And if you really wait until you're hungry, eventually you'll eat it but not ones that make you gag. Eventually, maybe they won't. And also, how you cook them makes a difference. I mean, if you do my lip smack and mouth watering kale that I showed on one of the webinars with the with the glaze and the, and the onions and the mushrooms, I mean, that's delicious. That doesn't have to be steamed plain kale. Use your balsamic vinegars, use your spices, or find another vegetable that you like, or cook it in a different manner, like in the air fryer and, you know. So, Susan wants to know if intermittent fasting is going to slow her metabolism down. She's making a point of not eating a few hours before bed, but she's often hungry, which is good for, e 
for eating veggies for breakfast, but sometimes it's more difficult to get sleep to get to sleep. And also Vince Ann asks if intermittent fasting of 16 to 18 hours a day is okay as mm -hmm. part of UWL. So I think of intermittent fasting as more of an advanced tool that people can do later if this program isn't working. There are people that have lost significant amounts of weight, over 100 pounds, just doing the Ultimate Weight Loss Program as designed without doing fruit and vegetable days, without doing intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is generally a technique that is recommended when somebody is five, six, seven, ten 10 pounds from what they think their goal weight is and the scale won't budge. If you have 20 pounds to lose or more, you really don't need to be doing intermittent fasting. You need to just be doing the program, number one. So that's more of an advanced technique. If you want more information on intermittent fasting, please go to my website and listen to the interview with Dr. Jennifer Murano. There's also an article on the True North website written by her that explains what it is and why we do it. Generally, it's about a 16 hour window of not eating and an eight hour window of eating, or maybe it's uh, six hours and 18, something like that. And so the idea is, is you eat all your calories within that framework. A lot of people, what intermittent fasting really looks like in reality is they're just skipping breakfast. And so they're eating lunch at 12 o'clock, they're eating dinner at five o'clock, they're done by six, and that's that. And so when you say you're trying to cram all the calories in, well, that's not, you don't ever wanna to try to cram calories in. That's not the way you do intermittent fasting. You, you still eat when hungry and stop when full, but you're narrowing the feeding window. And so you don't wanna to try to do that. I mean, if you're so hungry that you can't sleep, then there's a problem. And you have to, I mean, I personally, if I eat before I go to bed, then I really can't sleep. I mean, like yesterday I had Reiki. I have it all the time. I have it every three weeks for about the last 12 years. But the practitioner usually comes before dinner. But for whatever reason, she came after dinner. And just laying down after a meal, I was just sick the rest of the evening. So I don't recommend eating before going to sleep or laying down. But you have to eat enough sleep. And are you moving? To, are you moving? Because if you're exercising in the daytime, you've got to be tired when your head hits the pillow. If you're not tired, pillar. I'm from the shower. When your hair hits the pillar. <laughs> If you're not exercising in the daytime, that I mean, if you're not tired when you go to bed, you want to be, you, you're not exercising. I can tell you right there because when you exercise, you're tired, regardless of how much you ate or you didn't eat. And it's amazing because uh, the other day, I think it was Monday, I always walk Bailey two hours a day, once in the morning, once in the evening, and then I spin three days a week. Well, Monday, I forgot what happened, but I didn't walk her at all. Somebody, Charles did it, maybe, I can't remember the circumstances, but literally, because I got no exercise, I didn't get hungry until 4.30 p.m. And then I ate, and then dinner was, it's like my, my feeding window was like three hours. It's just incredible. So, you gotta get some exercise, guys. That's, that's part of the problem. If you're not losing, you're not moving. You know, exercise isn't what really causes you to lose weight. You can't outrun your mouth, as Dr. Furman says, but it does help increase your self-esteem and it helps you to stick with this diet and improves your willpower so that you can make healthier choices. It also makes you so that when you go to bed at night, you're tired. Um, Mary Lamb is watching live and she asks, can you ever drink an occasional glass of wine ever again? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mary Lamb, not Mary had a little lamb. Well, Mary, it depends what your goals are. I don't recommend alcohol for women, especially if you have the BRC gene in your family because even a very small amount of alcohol increases your risk for breast cancer and actually every cancer, the World Health Organization no longer recommends any amount of alcohol is safe. If you're overweight, if you're a food addict, you certainly don't want it if you have addiction in the family. So the quick, can you ever? Well, probably, you could probably do cocaine once a month or have a cigarette once a week. But again, what are your goals? You know, most people cannot just do these hyper palatable pleasure trap addicting type behaviors occasionally and if you can then maybe you can but most people can but i don't recommend alcohol it's seven calories per gram it's liquid calories it's it you know i, I if you can think of one good reason to drink let me know but I, I mean all the people i know it's either either makes them fat stupid or both and uh you know i've never seen anything really good come out of drinking in life but i've seen a lot of bad come out of it um sarah asked are dates okay on uwl depends so we have like two recipes in the 21 day guide that have dates as a flavor balancer so the yummy sauce and the marinara but you don't have to include them so if they're a trigger food for you or having them in the house is going to make you eat the whole box or tub then no 
You know, dates are still 1,300 calories a pound. They're more than six times the caloric density of fresh fruit. But food addiction exists on a continuum, and there are some people that can have them. I don't recommend them in a sweet recipe. They're 70% sugar. But as a professional chef, I don't know how to balance the really those flavors without it. So when in doubt, leave it out. Like in the marinara sauce, a lot of people leave it out, and a lot of people leave it out of the red lentil chili. That's just to balance the acidity of the tomato. You could try a carrot, a beet, uh, even, a, even a piece of apple could do it just to get that flavor balancing. So I don't recommend it if you're somebody that struggles with food addiction or somebody that's trying to lose weight. But I write my recipes so that regular people will like them too, and then I tweak them for UWL. In the cookbook, they're not going to be in the book, or there's going to be a way to say if you're making it for non-UWL people, this is what I would do. They don't seem to bother me in a savory recipe. Oh, the other thing people do is you can buy them individually or at least in bulk at, at many stores. So if you know you're gonna make red lentil chili, which calls for two ounces of dates, you go to the store and you weigh out two ounces of dates and it's going right in the recipe. But again, don't keep any food in the house. It's a problem for you or a trigger food for you, even if it's in a recipe. Kathleen says that breakfast, lunch, and snacks are easy for her. Mm -hmm. Family wants actual meals for dinner. Yeah. Suggestions? Well, if you're in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, we give you a 21-day recipe guide, and these are all entrees. So there's three weeks of dinners right there, and these recipes are delicious. They were tested on regular people who are not even vegan. People love the enlightened portobello mushroom. They love the red lentil chili. They love the enchilada strata and the chipotle bean burgers. And what you can do for meals is just do create a plate, like a bowl. Like so batch cook your beans, batch cook your grains, batch cook your potatoes, have it all out as a smorgasbord and have people build a plate or a bowl with vegetables and corn and beans and, and that's dinner. Let you know we have that's one of the recipe suggestions in the guide. The other thing is is if your family is not needing to lose weight and not food addicts, then make them recipes from unprocessed. You can make them the richer things like the disappearing lasagna. There's no 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 reason not to do that unless it's a problem for you and this this is real food for real people. So you know, make one meal and two choices, take it or leave it. If they want non-compliant food, they have to buy it, procure it, cook it, kill it, whatever, but you don't, you don't have to be the one to pull the trigger. Diane wants to know about sugar cravings. Mm -hmm. She's trying to get started and never realized how much she wants something sweet. Does yeah. this pass with time or is there something she can do now? Yes and no. A, you know, they lessen with time. As far as, okay, there's a difference between craving and desiring sweets. So in other words, we have taste buds on the tip of our tongue for sweet and salty. And so we're genetically hardwired to prefer the taste of sweet and salt for survival. So you can not eat sugar the rest of your life, but that doesn't mean you will stop liking sweet. So in other words, if somebody presents you with a delicious you know, piece of ripe fruit, you're still gonna like it even if you aren't craving sugar at the time. But what happens is the cravings lessen and eventually they go away if you stop indulging them. Because when you indulge a craving, that's how you actually intensify and perpetuate the craving. The best thing to do for sweet cravings is to do the thing I've been telling everybody for almost six years, which nobody wants to do, which is eat vegetables, particularly dark green leafies, and particularly eating them for breakfast. Because I've showed on two previous episodes, I've held up the articles from the medical research that shows that there's some compounds in them, especially the dark green bitter ones, that turn off the hunger switch and fight cravings for sweets. You can get the same effect for using the green powders that John Pierre recommends, sipping them throughout the day. And you can indulge your sweet tooth, but with fruit, the whole fruit, nothing but the whole fruit. There's nothing wrong with eating fruit. And one of the things that people do to, uh, to help with their sweet cravings is to eat sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes are incredibly sweet. As a matter of fact, sometimes they're too sweet for me now, especially the Hannah and the Japanese and the, uh, the Hawaiian. They're, I mean, they taste like cake. So are you eating enough starch? So that's what you do to lessen sweet cravings. And also realize that cravings are often emotional because you're eating because you're not hungry, but you're angry or tired or lonely and stressed. And so you crave these foods that are going to result in an increase of dopamine in your brain and you're not craving the kale. So yes, they do lessen with time when you have cravings. That's the time to do some form of distraction. Use your essential oils that JP recommends in the program. Get on the boards, interact with people, paint your nails, knit, do something with your hands, but they do lessen with time. And the truth is, is if you read my story in the book on process, 43 years, I ate no fruits and vegetables. I was one of the worst sugar addicts ever. And you know, I, I gosh, I haven't had like 
anything that you guys would think of as a dessert for like six years and I don't miss it. I mean, I crave vegetables, I crave rice, I crave potatoes. I, you know, the truth is, is whole natural food is delicious, it's satiating, it's satisfying when that's all you eat. But if you keep doing this dance and going back into the pleasure trap and having that occasional drink of wine, occasional rich dessert, you're never gonna not crave it. The only thing that stops cravings in its tracks is abstinence. And most people aren't willing to commit to that, but unfortunately, it's really the only thing works for an addiction. Moderation never does. Hard concept to sell. Not sexy, I know. But you can be sexy when you are it. <laughs> so Geraldine has said that she's been very inspired by you recently and has learned a lot. She said, I do, however, find myself a little confused at some inconsistencies I have discovered between some of the whole food plant-based doctors when it comes to the use of salt. Is it that Dr. McDougall, for instance, has changed his stance on the matter in more recent times and I'm just hearing old videos or what is really the story? I ordered some table tasty after watching you and Heather, but then I see things that make me wonder. Am I really majoring in minors or what? My personal experience is that I sometimes crave it, but my joints are much happier when I completely avoid it. So I'm going with that until I'm otherwise convinced that a little is okay. Thank you for the question, Geraldine. I actually took this off a private message from YouTube, which is sometimes difficult for me to do. I can't explain why it's hard for me technologically to get those kind of messages or Facebook messages. The best way to contact me is actually through my website, eatunprocessed.com. That's the best way to submit a question. Well, if you're in Ultimate Weight Loss, the best way is on the boards because I give priority to the Facebook group, even over my own email, which is why I have now over a thousand emails that I need to check. So, but I did was able to get this question. And first of all, as far as craving salt, it's natural, like I said earlier, our taste buds on our tongue for sweet and salty, these are genetically hardwired to do that with, for survival. We crave salt because our ancestors didn't always have water accessible all the time to drink. We had to drink from rivers and streams, which sometimes were polluted or dried up. And so in order to prevent dehydration, we craved the food that had the most salt, which was vegetables, greens. If you ever tasted celery after not eating salt, you're gonna like, wow, this is really salty. And so that's why that is in place because sodium is a precious mineral that we need. We can't not have any sodium, but if you eat a diet of whole natural food, and you eat enough calories, you'll get at least 500 milligrams of sodium, which for most people is enough. So if you're craving it, you know, maybe you weren't eating enough vegetables that day or eating enough food, or maybe it was hot outside and you were sweating and, and you were exercising a lot. So there's nothing wrong with that. So having the Benson's Table Tasty might take care of the, that, the emotional, the psychological part of the craving, but not the physiological, because if you need more sodium, you know, maybe you just need to eat more vegetables. You know, if you take uh, in, in the blender and, and actually make your own celery salt, which has no salt in it, you can buy something like that at Penzi's. So I actually looked into, oh, I'll answer the thing about Dr. McDougall. I don't think Dr. McDougall has really ever been wrong about anything or Dr. Goldhammer for, my, for that matter or Dr. Lyle. Now that doesn't mean that some of their colleagues don't disagree with them on certain points and I can tell you what points I think they are. But for the most part, Everybody in the whole food plant-based movement is pretty much in agreement, anywhere from 95 to 99%. The people, at least that are in my world, my mentors, the people I work with, they believe in a whole food plant-based diet. They believe generally in you no know, oil because oil is not a whole food, either is sugar or flour, by the way. And they, that's where they're on the same page, where they differ on certain things, maybe like supplementation, like with DHA, with vitamin D, those kind of things. So now, the only one that really, as far as I know, is, is very strict about the no salt is Dr. Alan Goldhammer. I think that Dr. Esselstyn might have gotten stricter with the no salt, that I believe the salt also injures the endothelial, so I don't think he's promoting salt, but it's possible that some of his recipes may have a little tamari, I really don't remember. But Dr. McDougall, has a wonderful lecture, I believe you can get it free on YouTube, where he talks about salt and sugar being the scapegoats. Now Dr. McDougall isn't telling you to sit there and eat a bunch of salt, because when most people get their salt, believe it or not, is not from the salt shaker, it's from processed food. There's actually more salt in bread than there are in french fries or potato chips, where the salt is put on afterwards on the outside. And so, the way Dr. McDougall recommends people that want to eat sugar and salt use it is as a, is a finish where you're sprinkling a little on your food. 
or where you're sprinkling a little sugar on your oatmeal. He's not suggesting you cook with it or eat with it. And my understanding is that the McDougal program, they don't cook with either sugar or salt, but these are offered as condiments for people to use as condiments, and that's what they're supposed to be. You know, there's no animal in nature that salts its food. And I remember recently speaking with one of the experts in food addiction who uh, runs a weighing and measuring program, and this individual said, well, uh, salt is not a trigger the way sugar is because it doesn't have the calories, and when people put it on their broccoli, it makes it taste better. And I said, well, when people put sugar on their food, it makes it taste better, so does that mean we should recommend sugar to people? The thing is, is salt has sugar in it. You may not know this, but you can Google it. All iodized salt has dextrose in it, so salt has sugar in it. Now, sea salt may not, but the salt that most people are eating, which is iodized, actually has dextrose in it. So you wanna be careful with that. Now, if somebody doesn't have high blood pressure, doesn't have heart disease, they're healthy, you know, if they wanna use the salt that way, that may be okay. Dr. Goldhammer is gonna be coming out with new research and a new article soon, explaining that there's more to this salt thing than just your health. He's gonna be doing studies on neuroadaptation because when you, whether it's salt or sugar or flour or oil or alcohol, any of these hyperpalatable stimulating foods that fool your brain satiety mechanisms, for most people, once you have them, you want them all the time and then you want more. And so of salt, oil, and sugar, and flour, salt is generally the hardest for people to abstain from because they don't feel the food tastes good without it. But the truth is, is if you can go a period of about 30 days, more for some people, less for others, you are able to neuroadapt, and that means neurological adaptation where you get used to. Sort of if you grew up drinking whole milk and then your parents switched you to non-fat milk for a while, you hated the non-fat milk, you thought it was too watery, but then once you got used to the non-fat milk, if you got, went back to whole milk, then you didn't like that, it tasted like paint. Well, that can actually happen with salt, but not if you're still eating processed food, not if you're still salting your food or eating other people's foods or eating in restaurants where they use way more salt than you'd ever use at home. But if you can go through that period of neuroadaptation, then on day 31, you eat a piece of celery or char and you're like, oh, tastes like the ocean. And that's really what happens. If you want this process of neurological adaptation to go sooner, then you fast. And then whole food tastes good. You know, Dr. Goldhammer jokes that in True North, they make good food taste not bad. But when you're not stimulating your palate with sugar, fat, salt, and oil, alcohol, and oil, and chocolate, and all these things, whole natural food actually really does taste amazing. And you can actually taste the salt in the vegetables and the sweetness in the vegetables. So I don't think Dr. McDougall has changed his mind. I don't think he's, uh, I, I don't think he's like saying that people can't eat salt if they don't want to. But let me tell you some research that I just came across and I thought this was super interesting because you know there's a saying, if you're a hammer you see everything as a nail and since my focus is on weight loss and food addiction, when I see an article like this, I get really excited. So it was a long article so I just Put the parts that I want to share with you today. It's called the Salted Food Addiction Hypothesis, and it may explain overeating the obesity epidemic, and it's from Dr. Mark Gold and James Corcoris. Okay, so it's, the, I'm just reading the summary, by the way, because these articles are really long, but I thought it was pretty interesting. One plausible explanation for the controversy that surrounds the causes and clinical management of obesity is the notion that overeating and obesity may only be a couple of symptoms associated with a yet to be discovered medical disorder. To introduce the salted food addiction hypothesis, this theory proposes that salted foods act in the brain like an opiate agonist, producing a hedonic reward, which has been perceived as being only peripherally flavorful, tasty, or delicious. The salted food addiction hypothesis also proposes that opiate receptor withdrawal has been perceived as preferences, urges, craving, or hunger for salted food. The salted food addiction hypothesis is made manifest by individually presenting a basic review of its primary coexisting components, the neurological component and the psychosocial component. We also designed a prospective study in order to test our hypothesis that opiate dependent subjects increase their consumption of salted food during opiate withdrawal. The neuropsychiatric evidence integrated here suggests that salted food acts like an, albeit mild, opiate agonist, which drives overeating and weight gain. And then it comes to different numbers, N equals, I guess I don't understand it, but they're saying that these numbers increase during opiate withdrawal. Salted food may be an addictive substance that stimulates opiate and dopamine receptors in the brain's reward and pleasure centers more than it is tasty. 
While salted food preferences, urges, cravings, and hunger may be manifestations of opiate withdrawal. Salted food and opiate withdrawal stimulate appetite, increases calorie consumption, augments the incidence of overeating, overweight, obesity, and related illnesses. Obesity and related illnesses may be symptoms of salted food addiction. So this is pretty amazing because we've always known that salt was an appetite stimulant. Don't believe me? Make some air pop popcorn, which tastes like packing peanuts. You'll eat as much as you'll eat. Salt it you'll eat way more. Any food that you like even somewhat, you'll eat more. So we've always known, because in, in, his, in his Maximum Weight Loss book, Dr. McDougall, I'm pretty sure doesn't recommend salt and sugar. It's been about a year since I've read that. But salt is an appetite stimulant. You eat more food when you eat salt. And so if the goal is to lose weight, then you want to eat less food. And so if you need to put salt or sugar or any chemical on your food, you probably don't really like the taste of your food you're eating. So that's when you really need to fast. But in time, if you stop assaulting your taste buds with hyperpalatable food and high fat foods and salt and sugar, this food will start to taste amazing. So thanks for the questions. Any other questions before we sign off? Because you and I have to, we have to go. We're going for a We're walk. We're good. Yeah. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much for watching another episode of Weight Loss Wednesday. Please consider coming to the live conference. I'd be happy to give you $100 off if you have questions. Go to www.eatonprocess.com. You want to sign up for my mailing list because I've got an interview with Dr. Lyle coming up that's going to knock your socks off. If you live in Washington, I'll be speaking at the Spokane Veg Fest this Saturday. September 22nd, next week at the PCRM conference in Washington, D.C. Then I will be at the Plant-Based Summit in Denver, Kelly Williamson's event on August 19th, August 20th at Linda Middlesworth's event called Get Healthy Sacramento, and then off to True North right before the conference. So hope to see you there. Thanks for watching another episode of Weight Loss Wednesday. I'm Chef AJ, and I truly believe you can have both the health and the desire you so richly deserve. Thanks for watching, and please share.